Good day and welcome to our channel, Alena Media TV. We are broadcasting from Toronto, Canada. My name is Elsa Abraham. We have some good news, and the good news is Alena Media TV would like to announce to our lovely viewers that we are expanding our programs. So kindly take note of our weekly activities. On Monday, we we'll report on COVID-19 and editorials. Tuesdays are African History. Wednesday, World News and Editorials. Thursdays, COVID-19 Report and African News. Friday is World History. And on Saturday is African News and Editorials. Another good news is we are starting a satellite broadcast very soon. This satellite broadcast will begin on the 20th of June 2020, which will also be Erythian Matres Memorial Day. Kindly take note of our frequency. Now sat vertical 12728. Symbol rate 27500. FEC 5 slash 6. The frequency again, nine sat vertical, one two seven two eight, symbol rate two seven five zero zero, FEC five slash six. We'll bring you more details after this short break. Kindly stay with us. <laughs> African news. And here is the headline. Erythians enduring the perils of betrayal and conspiracy. Now the news in details. Erythian President Isaias Afweke holds the distinction of being one of the longest seven rulers in Africa. This record alone puts him in league with such well-known African strongmen as Omar al-Bashir and Idris Deby. Yet, his capricious nature betrays the inspiration he draws from the likes of Umar Gaddafi and Theodora Obiang. Infamous for their even longer authoritarian rule, hence obviously unsatisfied by the level of notoriety he has already achieved. He seems to be looking to emulate the feat of dictatorial longevity the two achieved. President Isaias' absolute control and dominance over a country he has ruled with an iron fist for nearly three decades have earned him a place of infirmity in the annals of African political history. Seizing as he did with such immense power and exercising that power with author ruthlessness for a whole generation would be logically expected to satiate even the most callous of ambitions. But evidently, not so in Asaya's case. Erythian politicians and former associates with insights into his thinking have long argued that the man has ingrained secretly held ambition for political power and influence whose scope extends beyond Erythia to include Ethiopia and perhaps even the Horn of Africa. Subtle hints of such aspirations did indeed bubble from time to time in the president's authorities of the early post-independence years but it is his conduct since the 2018 erythia ethiopia rapprochement that made his obvious intentions find a more overt and frequent expression the nine-month period following the peace accord saw the two leaders exchange frequent states visits and hold repeated summit meetings amid a fanfare of publicity. Isaiah's speeches and decisions of that period were geared to advancing his original agenda in a way that threatened to undo Erythia's sovereignty and violate its territorial integrity. 
not surprisingly, therefore, the president's observed political maneuvers and the unholy alliance that incited them have since stocked debt, doubt, consternation, and even anger among everything. The dictatorship that President Isaias has imposed on Erythia is rooted in his sardonic betrayal of the very society that had bestowed on him so much honor and reverence. Like it or not, the man has arguably the most profound impact on modern Erythian history. His status as the nation's first and so far only leader is just a sequel to the dominant role he played during most of the long liberation struggle, including as its uncontested leader during its final years. Young Isaias was one of the few driven revolutionaries who gained recognition quickly after joining the armed struggle and steadily grew in stature over the first few years of service. And when he rose through the ranks to leadership positions, Isaias' fame soared among the population. Nevertheless, in contrast to his reputation as a rebel leader, his personal qualities remained largely unknown to the public due to the nature of his rebel organization, EPLF, and the realities under which his struggle was waged. It was not until after Erythia's independence that a window into the president's personal side was offered by his public engagement and governance direction. His public image began to take shape thereafter, fed by individual perceptions and by rumors that often swirled around his personality, physical health, and mental state. But there also exist credible reports on those issues by sources who either possess the withdrawal to be in the know. Their accounts, therefore, provide a valuable clue to the mindset that drove the president's recent potentially dangerous actions and statements. For instance, in secret democratic cables he sent to the State Department in 2008 and 9. Then, U.S. Ambassador to Erythia, Ronald McMullen, ends one of his brief appraisals of the political, economic, and social con conditions in Erythia with the statement, and the country's unhinged dictator remains cruel and defiant. The diplomat also relates views about Isaiah's mental state that a foreign official and a leading Erythian businessman confided in him. The earlier cables additionally characterized Isaiah as hot-tempered, unpredictable, paranoid with erratic behavior and mercurial temperament. Some of these characterizations were later echoed by Ander Behan, a formal senior official who worked intimately with Isaias for decades in both the EPLF and the PFDJ regime in morphed into following the country's independence. Erythia's present reality is defined by an economy that is at the point of death a society that is unrevealing and a political space that has shrunk to the point of exclusively accommodating a tyrant. The regime which engineered this reality lacks a constitutional basis, is devoid of people's representation and does not even possess a functional cabinet. It has systematically stripped public institutions of their legitimate authority and reduced them to mere instruments of oppression. In its functions, the regime scorns the rule of law and shuns the transparency and accountability. In the light of this stark truth, therefore, it is important to clarify the intended sense of the West in the section heading above. 
First, the heading should be understood to mean not a national policy direction, but one that is singly dictated by a strong man in the pursuit of his personal issues and interests. Second, the term policy is used here not in the ordinary sense of the word, but rather loosely to refer to the strongman's dictatorial agenda. The regime which dragged Erythia into its present sorry state has itself undergone a steady degradation, which over time led to devolve into successively more villainous and less inclusive forms of government. What started off as an incipiently democratic provisional government in 1993 degenerated in stages first to an authoritarian regime, then to a rule by sole party that supplanted national government and unserved its powers, and finally to a team guarded by the president and comprising a handful of aides and party officials, a few military commanders, and the chiefs of the national intelligence and security apparatus that cast a long shadow over life in the country. Despite these structural changes, however, the system has remained remarkably faithful to its blueprint of governance, which essentially includes employing policy states measures tactics to Im to intimidate muzzle and control the population secondly compelling the flight of national investment capital and capacity hence deterring foreign investment to impoverish the country and lastly subjecting citizens to forced labor thereby subjugating and dehumanizing the population. This policy has fueled on exodus of the youth and of the professional class out of the country while keeping the rest of the population cowered in fear of the regime. Erythia's wretched political and socio-economic conditions of the last two decades and their documentations by the international community provide in controvertible evidence that the aforementioned social tragedies have been happening on a ground scale and are in fact the intended goals of the regimes of the regime's government policy pursuing a policy marked by such levels of cruelty and mindless violent behavior especially of a criminal nature seems to be aimed at more than just perpetuating the regime's grip on power. The president's history of intrigue and conspiracy and his lust for limitless power suggests that the policy is designed to reduce the country to an unpoverished beat up and subdued society incapable of standing in the way of his adventurous quest for regional power and dominance. A corollary to the Erythia Ethiopia Peace Accord is an alliance that the leaders of the two countries forge under a cooperation agreement, the details of which remain unknown even to their respective governments. The period that followed these deals witnessed President Isaiah's newfound zeal for diplomacy and a revival of his long dormant ambition for power and domination over the Horn of Africa. No sooner had peace been restored than the president sprang out of isolation and partnered with the Ethiopian leader to launch a regional diplomatic campaign. Its declared objective was promotion of their shared vision of regional integration and unity. But subsequent developments revealed that it was in fact a bid to realize their respective ambitions for power and influence in the region. The campaign initially generated a flurry of frantic diplomatic activities, but it was not long before the scheme fizzled out with no tangible result. 
so having hit a wall with his original agenda the president seems to have subsequently decided to scale back on his ambition and for now focus his efforts on just ethiopia in his last interview with Erythian state media, the president strangely but ambiguously declared his intent to interfere in Ethiopia's internal affairs with the aim of influencing the course of its shaky political process. Logic suggestions that he is banking on his ill-defined and secretive alliance with PM Abi Ahmed and the latter's acquaintance to provide the vehicle and justification his interference will require. As for the Ethiopian people, Isaias has already been pandering to their emotions, intent in blunting their sensitivity to his planned meddling. His Ethiopia-related statements and actions of the past two years, for example, have worked up ultra-nationalist elites into reviving their deep-rooted territorial sentiments and ambitions. His singular goal now seems to be causing a widening segment of Ethiopian society into placing their trust in repentant identity defector who haven't previously fought a 30-year liberation war against the country. A sober con consideration of prevailing realities in Erythia reveals that the clock is ticking on President Isias and his regime, but bluntly the president is really running out of time to do much of anything. Nevertheless, his recent history suggests that short of experiences, mental or physical incapacitation, he will never abandon his quest for regional. Be guided by diplomatic political drama that the two leaders acted out periodically, some in the region had given support to the Isias Abbey Alliance. Much of it has been narrowly based opportunist support from special interest groups inspired by wishful anticipation that the alliance political parade will yield outcomes that serve their own selfish interests. However, the only outcomes the region witnessed in the last two years are political instability, economic downturn, civil strife, and large-scale population displacement draped in the political diplomatic gamemanship of leaders. This stark reality will hopefully remind ultranationalist zealots that events are being guarded and history is being shaped as they will in the future by factors other than the selfish wishes of the dreams of the few. This is where we end today's episode. Thanks for watching so much. Please share, like, let us know your comments and thoughts on this particular episode. Thanks for watching.